New All Too True Blue State Histories, Creative Histories, Connecticut. Excerpt from The New All Too True Blue History of Connecticut. Time Immemorial. First Flora, Nations, and Fauna. The first citizens of Connecticut were huckleberry bushes. The abundance of huckleberries in the area is what led Mark Twain to get the inspiration for the title character of his fable, The Adventures of Huckleberry Finn. In a pensive and reflective mood, Twain looked out the window of his upstairs study in Hartford one day and noticed the huckleberry bushes growing along the creek below. Up until then, the name of the protagonist of his book had been Fred. The title was to have been The Adventures of Fred Finn. Thanks to Connecticut and its huckleberries, the boy got a name change. As far as the first people in Connecticut are concerned, they were naturally Indians. Since living was easy there, the Indians had a lot of free time and often used it in thinking up ways to play jokes on the Euro-Americans. The Indians told the newcomers that Kinetic Cut was their name for the place and that it meant riding over Connecticut in a glass coach, mistaking one's equipage for blackbirds. Since they would always say this with a straight face, feigning stoicism is easy for Indians, the Euro-Americans thought they were being straight with them and accepted it at face value. Some still believe it. 1633, Dutch Fort at future location of Hartford. In 1633, ignoring the claims of the British that they had dibs on America, the Dutch erected a fort on the future site of Hartford. They tried to grow tulips there, but that was a non-starter. Just prior to that disaster, which convinced the Dutch that America was no place for them, a delegation from back home got a tour of the area, as you can see below. Riding along for a quick look, see of the area was Vincent van Gogh, the little Dutch boy who stuck his finger in the dock, and Ronald Dutch Reagan. 1636, Hartford founded. Hartford, future home of Mark Twain and his family, was founded in, eight, in 1636. Then it was losted for a while. Never mind that, though. Other famous cities have gotten losted, too, from Atlantis to Z. In no time flat, the Yankees had added some buildings and bridges to the area. Finding the bridges looked odd without water underneath them, they imported a river to enhance the scenery, as you can quickly ascertain from a brief purview of the abstract painting by Rembrandt. The imported river came from the ancient city of Babylon, thanks to Cyrus the Persian, who didn't want it there. 1740s, Great Awakening. During the 1740s, what was known as a Great Awakening took hold as people started drinking more coffee. And this was even before the U-Band campaign against tea, which came a few decades later. America has been wide awake ever since. In the scene below, those with a keen eye can detect a drip coffee maker or two in the tents. The orator explains the ways and means of using coffee grinders to awaken slumbering housemates. Coffee beans and human beings were meant to be the best of friends, friends. 1794. Eli Whitney's Cotton Gin New Haven's Eli Whitney, who later discovered Mount Whitney in California, patented cotton gin in 1794. Cotton gin tastes almost as good as bathtub gin, which is made from juniper berries. Cotton gin is also versatile. You can substitute it for dry white wine when company comes and you're out of Chardonnay, Sauvignon Blanc, Chenin Blanc, and Pinot Gris, which is distilled from 
gray pine cones. Whitney's ingenious, Rube Goldberg-esque, old-fangled contraption is seen below. It was newfangled when he dreamed it up, but that was a while back now. Cotton is so dry that it takes billions of bushels to produce a single sip of cotton gin. That's why it's so rare and thus expensive. 1806. Webster's Dictionary. Hartford's Noah Webster and his twin brother Daniel, who was born 24 years after him, published his first dictionary in 1806. Word nerds read it cover to cover, others only as needed. As an example, sample of Webster's handy reference, here is an excerpt from an early edition. Webster put it in because his fellow Hartfordian Mark Twain was talking about writing a book about castles and king's courts and such. Is this a fitting place for Connecticut Yankee? 1820. Antarctica discovered. The continent of Antarctica was discovered in 1820 by Nate Palmer grandfather of underwear model Jim Palmer, of Stonington. Two years later, in 1822, John Davis of New Haven became the first person to actually set foot on the Antarctic continent. Actually, he set his whole body on it, both feet, his legs, his torso, his head, etc., although it was only his feet that touched the ground, until he sat down. But then he quickly got back up again because it was really cold. At any rate, he set his feet on the ground, not just one foot. That would have been kind of lame. A fact of which few historians are aware is that Palmer gave the continent its name due to a discovery he made. On board his ship, the Oreo, he kept some pet ants in a jar of honey to keep them busy and satisfied. Sadly, he noticed that they died from exposure when he let them out of their honey jar for their daily romp along the forecastle as they were sailing alongside the icebergs. He thus deduced that this be a cold place for ants. Palmer knew that the Arctic, discovered by Nanook centuries earlier, was also a cold place for ants, as they were known to not exist up there. So he named his new find Antarctic. Later, a Mexican translated it into Spanish on a map he made, and thus the new continent became known as Antarctica. Ants aren't the only ones that think Antarctica is cold. Even the penguins wish they were in Florida, or at least North Dakota. Here's one who got tricked into going into the freezing waters. His friends are trying to appear innocent and stoic, but inside they're laughing their flippers off as he jumps right out again. Photo made available by Christopher Michael. Brr, I'll get you guys for that. 1832. First integrated schoolhouse in the United States. Connecticut had the first integrated schoolhouse in the United States in 1832, when broad-minded Quaker school teacher Miss Beadle admitted Sarah Harris to her school in Canterbury, Chaucer's alma mater. What was meant by integrated is that the Red Sox crazed community had heretofore not allowed any Yankees fans to share their school with them. Miss Beadle didn't care about baseball, though, so she let Sarah, a big fan of the Bambino and Gary Cooper, enroll. The other kids gradually got used to it, truth be told. Many of them were not baseball fans either, and even some who were, were not particularly fond of the Red Sox anyway. This was in the days before Ted Williams, of course. Who was this history-making Sarah Harris? She was the grandmother of Joel Chandler Harris, who wrote the Uncle Remus stories, and the great-grandmother of Phil Harris, 
who was the voice of Baloo in the Jungle Book. Joel and Phil shared that bear connection. The Uncle Remus stories had a talking bear, too. They got this from their grandmother slash great-grandmother, who brought a black bear to school one day to commemorate the Yankees' defeat of the Chicago Cubs the day before. This is the famous schoolhouse where Miss Beetle turned her back on convention and local prejudice and allowed the Yankees fan to attend her school, supplied by Kathy Klein. The blood-curdling yell of Go Yankees was oft heard spilling out of these windows during what was supposed to have been quiet times. 1835 Revolving Door Patented the Colt Armory diversified in 1835. Up until then, they had been making prosthetics for young horses, arms for colts. As the call for their product was limited, and most horses were scrapped for cash, Colt management decided to commence with the engineering of new products. First, they revolutionized the doorman industry by inventing the revolving door. Then, once their Dizian product became popular and revolving doors were installed in all throughout the government offices in town, their marketing department brainstormed a bit and finally came up with an idea for a new brand of beer to be called Colt 45 and sold to users and abusers of their revolving doors. This new brew was an instant hit as those who revolved inside the revolving doors until they got hot and dehydrated were easy marks for this liquid refreshment. The revolving door slash malt liquor business thrived and the business expanded, as seen in the painting below by Whistler's mother. To get away from her son, who was driving her up the wall with his constant whistling, his mother took up painting to get out of the house and away from the incessant din and racket. She found comfort in the painting of Smokestack. Note the subtle use of vivid and vibrant colors that she utilized to portray her true inner feelings about the scene. 1839 to 1841, La Amistad. In 1839, a bunch of Mennonites took over a ship that was taking them to the World's Fair. The Mennonites had their reasons for this shocking action. They had been assured that the ship was taking them to visit their mentor, Ned Ludd, in England. When they found out they had been hoodwinked, they mutinied, commandeered the vessel, which had been heading for Chicago, and commenced sailing it to the land of tea and crumpets. Sadly, though, they were captured by the French pirate Jean Lafitte, Taken in chains back to America, the Mennonites were imprisoned at New Haven. The Amistad, the vessel the Mennonites had taken as contraband of war, they considered forcing them to the World's Fair as an act of aggression, was towed to New London by the mother of all tugboats, a stout little vessel that had been christened the Foghorn Leghorn, which had been built and had endured its maiden voyage in Italy. The irate Mennonites who didn't want to see the newfangled contraptions on display at the World's Fair, were defended by Johnny Tremaine, Quincy Jones, and Adam Sandler. Some people say the name of the vessels. La Amistad is Spanish for friendship, or the friendship. Poppycock. Actually, it's German slang for city with American citizens. Ami is slang for a resident of America, and Stadt is the German word for city. That's the real reason Lafitte brought the ship back to America. It was not chartered to go to any other country, island, or planet. One of the Mennonites is shown below, named Cisco, with his bamboo flute. He was a member of the Mennonite polka band. Cisco later gave up Mennonitism and joined up with Sancho Ponza to star in the television series The Cisco Kid. He wasn't a kid anymore at that point, but Hollywood makeup artists and Latin manipulators can work wonders with that sort of thing. 